So, welcome back at the ThinkCon uh, Amsterdam uh, 2016 uh, conference. Uh, um, next guest, tell me uh, who you are and uh, what you do. Uh, my name is Michelle Thorne, and I work for the Mozilla Foundation, and I'm leading a program around the Open Internet of Things. Mozilla rings a bell from web browsers in the past and everything. Uh, uh, can you tell me a little bit more on uh, the foundation? Sure. So the Mozilla Foundation was started um, to promote the open internet. And so, yeah, we're best known for the browser Firefox. But now we're seeing as the internet kind of takes on a new wave, takes on different physical forms and shapes, we're also asking how do we advocate for the health of the internet in kind of this new era. So how do you do that? Um, so we do that through different ways. Um, we also have a lot of colleagues that work around advocacy, um, educational programs, um, as well as like technology, technology experiments. Um, and the work I'm doing is really looking at how do we um, make considered, crafted, um, and co-designed um, IoT that really fosters responsibility, um, openness, interoperability, and especially privacy and security. How, how is it going? I think it's gone quite well so far. It's our first year. Um, so um, today I'm giving a talk about uh, what we've learned so far and what the challenges are ahead. Um, the thing that I'm learning in particular is that you know although uh, most of our electronics are actually made in one city in uh, Shenzhen, China. There's also a lot of opportunity to think about how we make um, local IoT that might take into account the practices, traditions, and materials of different places in the world. Yeah, everything is going to be decentralized uh, thanks to making movements and, and, and new devices, 3D printers, you can do things more locally. But um, that's part of the IoT, and uh, I've been at a conference, uh, I was here yesterday as well, and, and um, I think uh, everybody you talk to has a different kind of definition of IoT. So what is IoT to you? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> a philosophical question, I guess. Um, I find IoT is helpful to describe actually in orders of magnitude. You know, we're talking about billions of devices, trillions of dollars in revenue, um, and like zettabits of, of data. Um, and so for me, it's less focusing on a particular sector and rather saying this is about um, you know, pervasive computing, this is about connectivity being everywhere and how that really is going to amplify the digital issues that we have today will just magnify them going forward. That's still a pretty broad definition. Sure. I mean, if you want a more specific definition, I guess you could say, um, you know, internet-enabled objects that are networked with each other um, and passing data amongst each other. That's maybe a better, a better way to describe it. Right. No. There's a lot of people walking around through the conference and experimenting uh, with uh, things and trying to find out uh, uh, new products or ideas and testing them. Um, at the same time, you feel that uh, there's, a, there's a lot of technology push, but there's also sometimes solutions looking for problems, and, uh, and it's, it's not really a mass market in that sense. How do you see that? Yeah, I think that um, in many places, in many ways, IoT has actually been pushed by by corporations um, wanting to say, you know, we've saturated the market for desktops and for phones, and now we have a lot of chips that we still want to sell. So what can we put in it? So you see more broadly in the IoT landscape quite a lot of efforts that are really about, you know, just sticking internet connectivity onto something for the sake of it as a way to extend a um, you know company's company's a uh, portfolio. Um, on the other hand, you see a lot of really grassroots, deliberate, um, thoughtful ways of using um, you know, internet-enabled devices. So you know, here also abounds many examples of you know, citizen-led initiatives to do things anything from monitoring like air quality to you know, agricultural data, um, health data. And so I think where this topic gets quite interesting is where we say, you know, let's not just take um, as given the, the things that larger corporations are saying that we need to buy and use and instead say what is it that we actually want, where is the internet actually going to be providing something unique and useful, which it can, um, and, um, and you know, where, where do these technologies make sense. So how are we going to do that? How, can, how are we going to make this next step uh, for, for the Internet of Things? I mean, I think the next step for the Internet of Things actually comes from places, conversations like at ThingsCon. So we really have a really impressive network, particularly across Europe, of professionals working in the field of IoT, from you know designers, developers, consultants, uh, you know, really a real range of, of expertise. And everyone here is coming because they care about human-centric, responsible IoT. And that kind of commitment to say, we want to make sure that these good ethics mean good business, I think that slowly can help shift where the larger where the larger system is going. Um, 
the part of the, the ecosystem are, are the large corporations, etc. And they're, they're sometimes harder to talk to and usually not present at these kind of uh, uh, conferences. How, how, do you, how do you get in touch with them? How do you approach them? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's worth inviting them to the table because, you know, they, they um, are quite influential. And um, in my experience, there's also, you know, individuals and teams within larger groups that are quite committed to these values as well. And they're just as eager to find allies internally and externally to help shift the conversation. Um, so in my experience, you know, if you're able to, to find, you know, one good ally, um, that can really help open up a conversation with a bigger company. Sure. But still, you see that, um, that there's especially the larger corporations uh, like Google when they introduce a new home device when, uh, which could record everything and, and store it. It seems that they, they find it hard to learn from the past and make the same mistake all over again instead of just talking to you and, uh, and develop something more sensible. So how, how, how do you get them on the table, keep them on the table and make sure that they don't keep on making the same mistakes again? I mean, I think the way we're going to change how um, you know mainstream IoT products are going to be made is going to be... a pressures from multiple places. One is around consumer demand, so there's a, a need to kind of have you know, consumer awareness, consumer, consumers asking for things that are more private, more secure, um, more open. Um, on the other hand, you also, you know, there's a role to play for you know, governmental and regulatory bodies to ensure that companies um, are respectful of those things. And then there's a role to play, I think, for um, some smaller scale, um, I'll call it, yeah, independent uh, industry actors to also be creating alternatives that larger, more mainstream projects can be using or building upon or referencing. You mentioned the uh, governments. Uh, um, from personal experience, uh, it's quite hard to talk to them because usually there's a lack of knowledge to understand what, uh, what you're working on and what the, the, the opportunities and the, and the threats are. And how are you dealing with that? I think particularly quite uh, quite privileged to be in the, the, in the Netherlands where I find the Dutch government has been quite um, open and supportive of these kinds of conversations. So, um, you know, I'd actually say the Netherlands is quite a leader from a governmental perspective of fostering at least the um, professional practice having these kinds of reflected conversations. Um, yeah, I, I, again, it's probably like large corporations that sometimes it takes just like one or two allies that, um, and in my experience, you know, be it with the Scottish government, which we worked a little bit with, or hopefully, you know, with the German government, you, you can find um, a few people there that really are helping to move things um, inside. So, uh, and one of the two of the two buzzwords that we uh, heard today uh, very often are uh, conversational uh, and, uh, interfaces and, uh, and AI. Uh, and these are relatively new new subjects. Uh, are these subjects that you're already focusing on uh, in, in, in the, 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 the corporation as well? Yeah. So, artificial intelligence um, is something that's actually it's been around for quite a while, and it kind of ebbs and flows, and it's. Um, in its, I guess, interest and applicability. I think AI is at a point where a lot of the building blocks for making um, AI-enabled products and services is much easier to piece together. So something that might have taken, you know, someone with a PhD in the topic or a large team now only can take one person using the existing GitHub repo. And so I think the um, ability to make things with AI um, is increasing. So we're seeing kind of a renewed interest in what you can do with it. Um, and on the other hand, you also see a lot more established players doing more sophisticated things with AI. Um, so I think a big opportunity is actually talking about how um, AI and algorithms get audited, because many algorithms today that govern, you know, the many important life decisions <laughs> um, and actions are actually in a black box. And um, we need ways that we're able to review and audit and make the algorithms that really shape our lives more transparent. And so I think that that's, a, that's the work of a lot of you know, people at ThingsCon and also something that Mozilla is interested in is how do you ensure that this technology that governs our lives is, is transparent and uh, understandable. AI can be very helpful. Are you using certain AI applications yourselves as, uh, as Mozilla? Um, Mozilla has a few experiments. Um, I think the most notable one is around an open source voice recognition system. Um, it was previously called Project Bonnie. Um, I'm not sure if it's a new, new project name. Um, and that's really looking at how do you create an open source alternative to um, you know, voice command, voice recognition. Um, that requires a lot of uh, AI. Um, and I, we're also doing some projects more in, the, in experimental space around how do you um, make things like facial recognition, recognition algorithms more 
um, legible and understandable to the people that are um, being affected by them, so that you can be more empowered in knowing when and how you want your um, personal image to be used. Yeah, but not for your personal research? No, not for personal research. Well, it could be. I mean, you obviously have to monitor a lot of things uh, that are happening. And, uh, Sometimes uh, new technology can help you to do your job better, but, uh, but that's not the case at uh, Mozilla. No, Mozilla really puts the emphasis on um, on user control. So they always have the ability to, you know, to opt out of something, to be transparent about what's being, you know, tracked or recorded. And as an organization, really take seriously, like less knowing less about uh, a user is better. Um, and so only introducing, you know, those features when it's when the, there's full consent. Um, and when it really makes sense. Sometimes people say that if we would have invented the internet now, then we would have thought a little bit more about security and privacy and these kind of things. Uh, uh, can't we just start over and create a new kind of internet? I, w I wouldn't wish that a task on anyone. <laughs> um, I mean, on the other hand, I actually think there there's many ways in which the, the messiness of how the early internet came together um, can be an example for what um, IoT could be doing. So, you know, you had these kind of Wild West days of the early internet, where there were many different like s efforts to make some standards, there were different efforts to make the these protocols come to shape, to come to life, um, and in the end, the things that um, succeeded were were running code, and so I think um, IoT can also learn from that and say like some of these are big academic discussions, some of them are really just practitioners sitting around and saying we're going to implement this, and that's going to be what shapes you know, shapes the scene. Walking around to the AD conference, did you see any any great examples of new uh, IT solutions? Um, I ha I've been doing so many workshops, I haven't even had a, a chance to look around. Um, I think one of the oh, no, one of the interesting projects is um, with um, Arduino. They've been looking at how you can have um, the messenger app Telegram um, command things in your in your home. And so I think as we talk about conversational interfaces, um, looking at how um, these examples can provide something that is um, user friendly um, as well as open um, and able to be modified and, and um, controlled by, by an individual. So I think that one's a quite interesting, uh, interesting project. And, and more or less secure because it's using Telegram. I guess so, although you can never say something is 100% secure. Um, so, uh, <laughs> no, me neither, but, yeah. uh, but it's supposed to be uh, at least uh, more secure than. Yeah, allegedly Telegram is a, um, a more secure platform. Um, I would, I'm, I'm not a secure, I haven't done an audit of it or anything to know, to know why. Do, do we need a, a, like an international auditing organization that could audit code and the devices? Um, I think some of that already exists. I mean, there you have um, the um, security community is quite active and prolific when it comes to being able to you know, identify when they're, you know, all the kind of white hat security um, hackers are quite prolific. Um, and so I think it's about also how do um, companies create incentives for um, white hat hackers to identify where there's exploits so that, you know, the company can be responsible and can patch them. Um, I think an interesting place to look at this is uh, DEF CON, which uh, this year, it's a big security conference, um, and this year had a whole IoT village um, where they were showing all the latest, like you know, exploits and, and dangers um, of connected products, and I think these kinds of like um, security conversations are really great when there's something to demonstrate as well. Um, and I think continuing to give them a forum to 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 research and um, and explain, and then also companies being able to like take that <laughs> take that research back and, and, and you know, work on improvements. So how many uh, IoT devices do you own yourselves? Probably like three or four, not too many. Um, we have an electric object at home, which is actually quite lovely. It's a connected um, picture frame, uh, and you can send art to it, different you know, digital media. Um, and that's a very um, kind of ambient, lovely object that we have. Um, we also have a Good Night Lamp, which is a project from uh, Alexander de Saint Chasino in London. It's a family of lamps that you can. Um, turn on the, the main lamp and a lot of the little lamps turn on is a kind of nice way to have a, a discreet or subtle communication with a loved one. So we have a set of those. Um, and now your smartphone, I would say, is also an IoT device. 
Did you, did you check them whether they're vulnerable or uh, can be hacked or anything, or did you forget that and then uh, you bought them for your home? I mean, both of them can be hacked. So um, the Electric Object runs on Raspberry Pi, which is known for being not the most uh, secure board. Um, and the Goodnight Lamp runs on Arduino. Um, again, these are um, open and semi open platforms um, and have different levels of like, security concerns. Um, but no, I mean, we should probably, you know, it'd be interesting to have a conversation where people try to, you know, compromise their electric object and talk about what that means and what can you do in the, uh, if it's a compromise. You know, just trying to figure out is this uh, obviously uh, when you when you work and you talk to large corporations, you think on the big picture, and it's uh, sometimes a difference from the things you bring home, and, uh, and you have a different perspective on security and uh, things like that. So that's why, uh, why, why I was wondering how to work with you. <laughs> no, it's a great question. I mean, and there are there are many connected objects and, and devices that I haven't bought because of more privacy concerns. Um, so you know, a lot of the things like you know, connected TVs or connected home assistants and things like this. I um, don't love the idea of you know my TV listening on me and sending all my conversations back to the cloud even when it's turned off. Um, so I think those are examples of things I have not <laughs> um, purchased because, because of those concerns. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. and enjoy uh, your conference at uh, the you. Kingscon uh, Amsterdam uh, Conference 2016. Thank and, you very uh, much. I hope you have you back uh, someday? I hope to come back. Yeah, I love Amsterdam. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>